Welcome to Master Gardening. I'm your host Bud Kwok and we're here again at the University of Kentucky's McCracken County Extension Office. We're here with the Master Gardeners and we're going to talk about raised beds. Everybody loves raised beds, but we're going to talk about raised beds that water themselves. Are you interested? Stay tuned, we'll be right back. So I am the McCracken County Horticulture Agent and I also advise the Master Gardeners and today we're going to be talking about gardening and also the wicking raised beds and as Bud mentioned it is hot so I didn't want to have you guys all in the hot sun today. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I didn't want to be out there either and we also had a chance of rain this morning didn't get that but after this presentation which won't be horribly long uh, Anyone is welcome to walk with us out there. It's right across the parking lot up there, the wicking raised beds, and you can get a full hands-on view on what they look like, how they work after this presentation. So please join us if you would like. You're welcome to also drive your cars up there if you'd like. So we're gonna get started today, and first we're gonna talk about gardening simplified. And so a lot of people ask, what is the extension office and what do we offer? It is the Kentucky Cooperative Extension is the educational resource for all Kentuckians that serve as a catalyst to build better communities and improve quality of life. And we have a lot of different departments here. We have agricultural natural resources, horticulture, which is my department, forestry, aquaculture, which was last month. We have nutrition, 4-H, and family consumer sciences. And for 2022, uh, the district board helped us with this. We are offering fr seven free soil samples per McCracken County resident. And we're just going to hit on a couple different glossary terms for gardening. So annual, as many as you know, it's, uh, they bloom one season and die. Perennial, they bloom each season once established. Beneficial insects, a lot of people, they'll see insects on their different vegetables and they flick them off. Well, there's actually a lot of beneficial ones. And they can be ladybugs, which I thought it was really neat. I saw a couple ladybugs eating some aphids, some green lace wings, and parasitic wasp eggs. And next, uh, biennial is a plant that lives two seasons, and they bloom the second season only. Cover crops are really important during the winter time. Uh, they are grown with a primary purpose to help protect the soil between the seasons. And of course, crop rotation is very, very important in your gardening. So it kind of helps with disease and different fungal. And let's see, and propagate is to grow new plants from seeds, cuttings, and division. This is really popular with succulents. And of course, taking part in gardening activities helps promote healthy habits, including spending time outdoors, being physically active, and consuming homegrown fruits and vegetables. Because I don't know about everyone here, but it tastes so much better, <laughs> tomato does, especially in cucumbers, which I have a couple in my bag to take home. And so we're going to talk about, uh, after the last frost, finding a good location, determining your budget, and decide what best grows at your site, gathering all the supplies needed, the plants you need, maintaining, and the fun part is harvesting. So after the last frost, everyone around February and March calls me and says, when can I plant? I'm ready to get in the garden. <laughs> and so frost is possible around here at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and below. And typically the last frost date is late April. So I always tell people um, Mother's Day is a good day to plant just to be safe. But you know, people can plant sooner and then they can plant later for a late harvest. And as you know, soil temperatures matter. Uh, seeds can rot if they are left in the cold soil too long and then they have trouble germinating. And finding a good location, you want full sun, something that is convenient to where you are because no one wants to walk across fields to get to their garden and it's a lot better with water supply as well. You want workable and good well-drained soil 
a water source nearby, so you don't have to drag your hose really far watering cans, and good air circulation. So for full sun, we recommend at least six hours of direct sunlight. The wicking raised beds of the barn, which a lot of you will see here in a little while, they get full sun all day, every day. They love it. And so sunlight patterns change in spring to summer and fall, as you know, it moves around. And full sun now may be in part shade in August, so make sure to keep that in mind when you plant. And then, of course, watch out for structures, never plant or build under power lines and trees. A lot of trees crowding is harder on the air circulation. And shadows can cast up. Cast by objects to the south will lengthen to the north as growing season goes from first day of summer to fall of the year. Next, determine your budget. A lot of times, whenever you're planting, it starts getting more expensive, then you have to buy more plants and more soil, so make sure to Put that in as well with your budget, in case your plants die or you need more soil. Fertilizer, especially nitrogen, can be used by growing plants. Seeds are usually cheaper than transplants, but I know it is a little bit harder sometimes to propagate those. Uh, transplants are usually purchased in four packs or six packs. And water hose most likely will be needed to water later in the season. So make sure to check your water hose, make sure it's ready and it's good and doesn't have holes all throughout it. Garden tools that you might need are some trowel, a hoe, a, a shovel, and maybe a rake. <clears throat> and garden gloves are helpful. I've always bought them. I've never used them. I feel like it's good therapy, horticulture therapy, to really get your hands dirty in that soil. <laughs> I love it. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little hoarse after 4-H camp. <laughs> so next, um, continuing. Growing from seed can save money, as I said. <clears throat> see. Purchase plants can save time. If you just want to hurry and put some plants in the ground, eggplant has a long growing season. And of course, buying plants earlier allows for an earlier harvest. Let's see, and at the very bottom here, soil testing is possible at the extension office. And we have our address right down there and seed packets. They have planting instructions and information. Also, they have a little map there at the bottom, and it will tell you your growing season. Does anyone know what growing zone we are? Yep, yeah, you guys are good. That's a trick question always, it seems like. And they'll also tell you around the date to plant, how depth you need to plant it, the spacing, which is all very important. And they also can tell you how many days to harvest. I did a class recently in elementary school, and they put the little tomato seed in the ground in the little bucket, and they said, well, when am I going to get a tomato? <laughs> it's like, well, you know, it takes a little while. <laughs> so that, I thought that was really cute. <laughs> and a lot of people, they call the office looking for organic seeds, and what we recommend, they are a little bit more expensive, and they just um, it depends on a personal preference, what you like. Here's an example, a picture of one. And next, you're going to decide what grows best at your site. If the site has a small space, consider the mature size. Make sure it has plenty of room to spread its arms, I always say, and grow. A lot of plants don't like to be overcrowded, or they start growing on top of each other. And let's see. Some good plants for small spaces include onions, lettuce, cabbage, green beans, and patio tomatoes. And some larger spaces needed are sweet corn, cucumber, watermelon, field peas are good examples. I learned I put cucumbers and watermelon next to each other, and they are just having a lot of fun up there intertwining. <laughs> Raised beds do cost more than just putting your plants in the ground, but they are a good go-to. Let's see, pro mix, a budget for professional potty mix. That's the potty mix I always recommend. It is a little more costly, but it has great nutrients in it, good texture. I've never had a problem with drainage. And also, you don't have any weeds, or a lot less weeds than you would in the ground. And raised beds, they do warm up quicker, 
but they are beneficial to an early start. They're easier to reach so you don't have to bend over and hurt your back in the ground. And um, you can have sides of plastic, lumber, metal, or just sloped without sides. Up at the barn, as we will get here into a little while, they are, we have lumber around them to contain it. And here's some examples of professional potting mix. And next, the nutrients. Whenever you get your soil test, you'll kind of see which, these are the main ones we always recommend to add or not add. Um, and organic matter helps improve the soil in many ways. You have improved drainage, improved spore spaces, slow release fertilizer in most cases, which that is my preference on fertilizer. And it helps with moisture, I can never say that word, retention. And um, we've had this question, please do not use human waste as a fertilizer. <laughs> um, I highly recommend goat waste, I think is the way to put it. That's apparently the best fertilizer you can have. A lot of people use chicken as well. And next, gather your supplies that you're going to need, your seeds, your transplants, your fertilizer a good watering can, watering hose, and some labels so you can remember what you plant and what they are, such as different varieties and things. And next, you can plant. Some plants may be grown from seed. And of course, make sure to plant at seeds at correct depth. And cover with soil or soilless media. Some may be installed as plants transplants. Use a trowel to help with that. And let's see. And of course, don't press too hard. A lot of people, they like to push this plant really hard in the ground, and that's harder on the um, airflow around it. You want it kind of nice and fluffy around your plant, but not too much where it'll fall right over. Let's see. And we have these available at our front office whenever we're open. I call it the Horticulture Bible. It is a very great resource. It's a little pamphlet you can get. It is free at the front office. And it talks about anything you need to know about gardening, uh, companion planting, dates to plant, soil testing, everything involving gardening is in this. And next, you're going to maintain. Make sure to keep it watered, especially in these hot days. I kept having phone call after phone call, why is my plants dying? I said, well, it's 110 degrees outside. It's just, hold on, it's a hot, I know. And of course, weed in our raised beds at the barn up there, I rarely ever have to weed. I did a little bit this morning just so it looks nice, but I love it, never have to weed. And let's see. We also, I don't use any herbicides around there, insecticides, that's just my preference. And of course, watch out for your insects. Japanese beetles loved my kale this year. That is our hot topic this year, I think, is Japanese beetles. They ate everything. <laughs> and other than that, I haven't really had any insects lately, or harmful insects. And of course, UK always tells us to read and follow um, labels on your chemicals that you use. And my favorite part, the harvest. Pick when it's fully ripe, store properly, and consumed. Do not refrigerate tomatoes, that's just a preference as well. And they say cold temperatures can cause the tomato tissue to collapse. I always leave mine on the counter. And I always like to harvest in the morning so it's not all in the sun all day. And I'll just put them right on my counter then. And this is my favorite companion planting chart. Everyone should have one. They're just kind of scattered throughout the room. I have extra as well. This, I would put it on my fridge. Um, as you can see, the different colors. Uh, the first one, plants grow well together, that dark green. And it will tell you, like, oregano likes basil. And then in the red, do not plant them together. Let's see. Broccoli does not like being plant planted next to peppers. So just a really great resource for everyone. And if you ever want to share it with your friends, I can make copies for you. I always hand these out, try to at every presentation that I do. But, and of course, uh, a lot of times if you plant them next to each other, 
like onions, they'll chase away different harmful insects to other things just because of the smell, so that helps a lot as well. Let's see if there's another one on here. Like oregano and cauliflower, that helps bug control, so that helps with not having to apply different insecticides and things on there. So I thought it was very interesting for everyone. And why everyone came here tonight, we're going to now talk about the wicking raised beds. We always get asked, what is wicking? What, what does make this such different? And we have a couple of the publications on the back table back there. So first, what is a raised bed? A raised wicking bed is a self-combined method for growing vegetables, fruits, herbs, and flowers. And it has a built-in water reservoir that allows plants to water themselves. What more could you want in gardening for your plant to water itself? So I, had, I probably read this when we first built these about 20 times to understand this. But the science behind the wicking bed, you, water for plant growth is provided by a reservoir located at the base of the bed, which, as you can see whenever we go up there, the water will sit in these corrugated pipes at the bottom, which is another piece of it. And they use a capillary action to provide plants with water. So the plants, whenever they get nice and fully grown, they will pull the water up from in here, and there's little holes throughout this, and water themselves. Some advantages, they are self-contained. They are great with uh, individuals with limited space. They help reduce weeds, and they capture rainfall. Some disadvantages, it was a little pricey to build this. Um, and the beds, and the fall beds may freeze sooner than non-raised beds. But I didn't have any problems with that last year. I actually had a couple plants come back. And just the general price list, of course it fluctuates a lot. Right now it's fluctuating high. I think ours cost us per bed about $400. So it is a little bit more pricey if you want to follow exactly the way UK set it out. And now we're going to go into the different parts of this. And as well, in this little publication, it has a little bit closer picture for you guys of this. Let's see if I have it on here so I can read it. So the very top one on the left is six inch corrugated pipe with half inch holes, which is this piece right here. And then the second one down is a pond liner. Whenever we built the raised bed, we lined it, or I should say the maintenance man lined it for me with a pond liner to help contain the water and all the soil in there so it holds it in there. It does not touch the ground. The potting media is the next one on the top. And the second layer is compost, and the third layer is peat moss. I just kind of divvied out about a third. I balled it of each. Let's see. And then we have it on the side. You'll be able to see it up there. It's an overflow tube. So if we just get buckets and buckets and buckets of rainfall, then it will drain out of there. So it just doesn't, the whole bed's not a pond. <laughs> which that could have happened last week. <laughs> Let's see. And then as well, the little white tube coming up it, that's just another way to fill it. As well, you can stick your water hose down in there, grab some vegetables, you know, finish up your gardening and pull it back out so you don't sit there and hold it. And some more different components. Raised beds frame, a pond liner, planting media, pipe, the fill tube, and the overflow tube, as I had mentioned. This is just kind of a more broke down picture of it as well. Again, the maintenance man, who's now our 4-H agent, was very helpful with helping me build this last year. <laughs> and next, the site preparation. Make sure it is in full sun, as you will see at the barn. Mine never see shade, which sometimes you have to watch that. A flat surface, 
that was a little bit harder to find up there. Um, make sure it's nice and flat. You might have to move some ground around and easily accessible. I have mine very close to the water spout. I make sure to put that close to there. And now we're going to learn how to build the raised bed. Assemble the bed as shown using construction lag screws. And we kind of, we had to put the different little, the correct term for them, the pieces of pine that stick into the ground, we put that around there. And we, or the maintenance man nailed it all together for me. And once the box is assembled, you use a hammer to drive the stakes into the ground. So it doesn't have a bottom? No, ma'am. It does sit on the ground. It the contact, but the pond liner is the barrier. It is. The pond liner will sit, the pond liner touches the ground, and then the corrugated piping goes on top of that. Top of yep. okay. And you, here's the pond liner right here. That was the tricky part. It was getting it nice and smooth as we could and around on the edges. That's how we held it up. We used nails to hold that on there, but that was the tricky part. That was a little bit harder because you really can't stand in there and move it around. But that's what sits on, that's what touches the ground. And then next, these are just an example of what they look like. You lay four deep in there of the six inch perforated drain pipe. And that's where your water will sit inside of here. And then next you'll insert the hole for the drain tube. Uh, should line up with the perforated pipes. I, about right here is where it will sit on there. So you can have a good overflow. Let's see, and then of course insert your drain tube and with the drilled hole until it presses the pond liner. Let's see, and then you create, uh, using a knife, create an X on the pond liner over the end of the drain tube and push the drain tube through the opening. And next, inserting the fill tube. It's just a preference on um, which one you want to use, the white or the other piece of corrugated piping. Let's see. Install the fill tube using a hole saw to match the pipe. That's this piece, you'll just stick it right down on top of the other pieces. And you can either, I like to water in this one, so I just stick it down in there and then I can also see uh, how much water's in there a lot better to see how much further I need to go. And the distance between the fill tube and overflow should be at least 12 inches. And the filter fabric should be placed at the end of the bed. And this is what UK recommended. We did not do a water level gauge. I just always kind of look over it and see about how far I need to go. Or sometimes I'll just fill it up till I see the water coming out of the overflow. But this is how they constructed it. They placed a bamboo, bamboo skewer in the end of a bottle cork by adding a bead of hot glue to secure the two. A red twist tie is used to mark the level the water needed for the drain tube to flow. I, I thought that was a really good idea. We just didn't for some reason do that as well. The kitchen composter and water fill tube with a cover. You can, if you want to use it as a composter, you can put different things down in here. And that was just their cover, so it, I guess it doesn't smell. And they also put one over the other fill tube as well. I think I've noticed uh, mosquitoes will lay eggs in here. And they all come out whenever you water. So it's really great to also put that on top of there. <laughs> I learned that the first year. <laughs> that standing water, they love it. And next, you're going to put all your potting mix in there. Layer in a potting media used to create the soil matrix for the wicking <laughs> raised bed. The first layer you'll put in is your peat moss. The next is your compost. And the last is your potting media. We used ProMix for our potting media. And we found all of this at a home center downtown. And that is all I have for the wicking raised beds today. And just a quick summary, um, it can be an effective and efficient piece of gardening infrastructure. 
a self-contained method for growing vegetables, fruits, herbs, and flowers. The built-in water reservoir, it's great and it allows plants to self-irrigate. It also cu really cuts back on your watering. Design is used for accessible hardware and basic skills to create a raised wicking bed. And it's great for individuals new to gardening. I think especially it's great for your back. And also it's wheelchair accessible. I always like to mention that as well. We've had a lot of visitors from our sister living next door come visit them, which makes me happy to, that they're enjoying it as well. And then I just have lots of different references as well for everyone. Thank you for tuning in. This is Master Gardeners. I'm your host, Bud Kwok, and until next time, good gardening.